Today's guest is Carrie Roberts, and I love Carrie so much. We sat next to each other at an event recently. I, I and I met her sitting next to her, and then we saw each other at another event three weeks later. So I didn't know her two months ago, and now like I feel like she's a friend. So she has a very interesting business, and I wanted to bring her on because I wanted her to share her story because it's a a story of passion and purpose and her following this, this thing that was inside of her actually from a young age, uh, which she didn't start doing till later in life. I mean, she dabbled in her gift, but um, she really has turned it into an amazing business and really providing a service that is, is well received and, and affects thousands of people. And I'm not going to tell you what it is. You're going to have to listen to find out. But one of the things she said in her application to be a guest on my podcast is, and I wanted to share it because I, I think it's powerful, uh, but she says, we are all given gifts and talents. And what I'd like to interject there is we often don't even know what they are, but they've probably showed up in our life in some way, shape or form. And we're just not recognizing them as gifts and talents. Sometimes we think it's the obvious ones. But there's sometimes there's things that are inside of us we haven't even tapped into. She goes on to say, sometimes the best things in life come after spending years caring for others. We finally have the chance to explore and doors open when we least expect them. We, dis we discover who we have become and the person we have grown into. We have the chance to serve ourselves and others in ways we could never have imagined. And her goal, and this will give you a little insight into what she does, but you still won't know until you listen, but her goal is to bring beauty into people's lives through the work of her hands and to help others see that they can use their time and talents to do the same. So I'm excited to share with you Carrie Roberts and her story. Welcome to another episode of Living Your Spark Second Half. And today I have a special guest, Carrie Roberts. And Carrie Roberts is about my age, a couple years younger, but she uh, is in the mastermind I'm in. And I met her in uh, well, about a month ago. I've seen her twice in the past month, <laughs> two different uh, retreats. But uh, yeah, she, we ended up sitting next to each other casually. And uh, I love what she does. It's so interesting and so fascinating uh, that it's grown into a late in life purpose of hers, but it, yet it was kind of an, something that presented itself when she was very, very young. And so I'm going to let her share the story and we'll talk a lot about what she's learned along the way. Uh, and I think this is going to be a great episode for you if you are someone who is, well, maybe not yet found your purpose, but it's there waiting for you. And it's probably been surfacing in ways in your past. So welcome, Carrie. Thanks, Lori, for having me on your podcast. It's It's been a pleasure to meet you over the past month and, and to see you a couple of different times at our events together. And um, I just want to um, thank you for this opportunity to be here and to share with your listeners. Yes. Well, you have lots of value to share. And I'm so glad we sat next to each other. Uh, and I, I think that, you know, the universe has a hand in that. So when I sit next to somebody interesting, I'm all, the first thing I always think is I have to share you <laughs> on my podcast with my audience. And uh, I got to meet your one of your children as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because the first, the first event we met at was a leadership event. And it's for people who are have their own businesses, whether they have a team yet or not, uh, because there's such a value in having a team and growing your business because you can only do certain things by yourself. <laughs> and uh, and so I have my son-in-law working for me and she has one of her sons. I, actually, they both, two of your sons work for you? Um, actually, um, almost the entire family works with me in some capacity, but daily my um, son, Christopher, works with me. And I'm also blessed to have my son-in-law, Travis, work with me every okay, day. Okay. Yes. Your son-in-law. That's right. Yeah. Yes. That's so we great. That. Yes. Yes. So what do you do? So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a creative person. I've always been a creative person since I was um, a young child. And um, my hobby and love and passion is sewing. Um, I'm trained as a, as a fashion designer. 
and um, and during during the years, I've I've done a lot of different things. I've done bridal. I've done um, home decor. I worked in industry and so forth. And then uh, over the years, I I just ended up falling into an unexpected niche, and that current niche is working creating church vestments. We have a couple of different areas that we do. We do custom done for you, high end. Um, custom consulting and from start to finish, we make all of the vestments and the pyramids that are used in churches for their worship. And then we also have the fabrics and the trims and the patterns for those who would like to learn and explore and, and do things on their own. So it's um, something I never expected to see myself doing, but yet here I am at my age doing this. Yes. And you can see some of her work on our Facebook page. Ecclesiastical Sewing is your right. name, right? Because I, when you said that church vestments, I, what came to mind for me was money, <laughs> like money. Like I'm not a church girl. I mean, so I do my own like worshiping in my own house and mm -hmm. my own wor world and way. Uh, and, and so I, I think it's just fascinating. So for people who don't know what a vestment is, how would you describe it? So, so church vestments have an ancient history. Um, the, the garments that we make today have a history that goes back almost 2,000 years, dating to the time of the Romans, and some of them even older than that. And over the centuries, they've changed and they've grown and they've, they've evolved into what they are today. So the vestments would be things like the stoles that a pastor would wear. It's, it's a narrow strip of fabric that's worn around the neck and it can be plain and simple or it can be embellished. Um, other pieces that they wear that you might be familiar with is called a chasuble. If you think of it somewhat like a like a poncho you know something with a hole in the middle of it that goes over the head but it can be rather a full garment um and then they just lift up their arms and and it's kind of poncho isn't really the right word but it's something that that a common garment that people could relate to and those vestments can be decorated either very plain or or be made quite elaborate. So those are things that maybe people would be familiar with and seeing movies or that kind of thing. Yeah. And then the draping on the tables. That, yeah. And, and I, I'm curious too, because this came to mind, do churches have colors? Like, you know, how a school has its colors or a team has its colors? Is, sure. Are there color patterns? Yeah. So there, there are five liturgical colors that relate to the different times or seasons within the life of the church. So white and gold are the colors used for the high festival seasons like Christmas and Easter. Those are the highest festival seasons during the church year. Pentecost is a, is a, um, a celebration that red is used for. Red's also used for in remembrance of people who were maybe martyred during the life of the church. Lent, the season of Lent that leads up to Easter is a penitential season. And so we use violet for that season. And then there's a period of time that's called the ordinary times and green is used during that. So that's typically the long summer season green is used for. And then for a short season between Christmas and the beginning of Lent. And then some churches do use blue uh, for Advent, the season leading up to Christmas. So, so yeah, there there are specific colors for church for the church here in the church calendar, and uh, and um, the church calendar kind of the seasons to determine what colors that you use. That's so, so interesting. I never knew that. Love yeah. this. Love love learning. Uh, yeah. So, can you take me back to when you were a child, first of all, how'd you get the knowledge in sewing and the interest? Uh, and what, because before I hit record, you had mentioned that actually something flared up when you were younger that was along this line, along these lines, but um, yeah. And you weren't always in fashion. Weren't you in business in some way yes. first? Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's go back in time. And so, so back in time, my, my mother, uh, learned how to sew at a young age, and she was a fantastic seamstress. 
She she learned to sew growing up in 4-H. And I, I always remember my mother sewing. She always made, back then we wore dresses to school and my mom always made my dresses. And, and I remember being about eight years old and mom let me have some scraps of fabric and a needle and thread and showed me a Barbie pattern and I cut out and made my first Barbie garment when I was eight. That's hard. They're little. Yeah, little, little, little fabric. I'm just picturing how hard that would be from a regular piece of like, an, a, like when I, I t- dabbled in sewing taught myself and I, it, at the time it was like my kids and they were like maybe five. Right. So, so I can't imagine working with something smaller. Right. Right. So, you know, little fingers, little pieces of fabric, needle and thread, and I don't know how I did it, but I put it together. And then I remember my mom did go to have to go to work at one point in time. And so she was wondering what to do with us during summer vacation. And she signed us up for summer school. She signed me up for a sewing class and a hand embroidery class. And it lasted about six weeks. And during that period of time, I learned to make a backpack and a little smock top. And that was it. I fell in love with sewing at that point in time and then took every sewing class that I could take during my school years throughout back then what was called home economics. Yeah, I had home ec. Yeah. I think I can't remember what I made. I think it was a skirt with elastic waist or something, right. something simple, no zippers. But yeah, so and were you getting like lots of compliments on what you made? Oh, always. I was always the one that uh, everybody, you know, I, I had clothes that other kids didn't have because I could make my own. And so um, it, it was a way to develop your own sense of fashion and your own sense of style. Yes, and, your uniqueness. So, right. So true. Yeah. And um, I was I was blessed that my mom always encouraged my love of sewing. And when it came time for college and didn't quite know what to do, it just seemed a natural fit to explore the opportunities for design school. And so I um, got enrolled in, in design school and, and got my degree in, in fashion design. OK, so your degree was in fashion design. Did you follow that? And, and immediately jump into the fashion industry? Well, I, I knew in getting the design degree, I, I lived in Minnesota and I knew it would be limited with, with what I could do with the degree. Um, I knew if you really wanted to pursue it, you'd probably have to move to your New York or another place like that. And I wanted to stay at home and, and be near my family. So a, a natural opportunity that opened up to me is I was working at the time in a fabric store and we had a large bridal department and I would help the brides with planning the fabrics and things for their wedding and as I finished design school and they were asking do you know anybody that could sew the things for our wedding it became a natural fit and and so I started working with brides in my early 20s, learning, um, helping them make their bridesmaid dresses and doing their custom bridal gowns. And I probably did that for about, probably about 10, 10 years or so, um, helping brides make all of their, their items for their weddings. Now, did you stay at the fabric store or did you move off and kind of do your own thing? Where you I were helping? moved off and did my own thing. Oh, so a young entrepreneur. I'm a, a young, a yes, yes. <laughs> it, it, it struck at a young age. So, <laughs> and did you marry during this time? I, I did marry kids? during this time. Um, and then um, a little bit later, um, when we started having our, our family, I realized having white things around the house with a young family maybe wouldn't be the best option. Um, <laughs> <It's> so true. <laughs> and, um, and, and before I married, I actually had somewhat moved out of bridal and, and worked in industry and, and worked in product development and so forth. So, um, so that's, that's where I got some international training and, and the international markets were just opening up during the early nineties. Okay. So that's yeah. great. Got a taste of that different type of business. Right. Right. Yeah. And then, uh, we moved to a small town and, um, I had the opportunity to stay home and raise my family. So again, my love of sewing was a way for me to have um, a little bit of money to do my own things with and 
to feed my passion. <laughs> and so I, I got involved in home decor and I, I worked with somebody doing a line of children's wear clothing for a few years. And then I, I homeschooled my children. So um, sewing did take a little bit of a back seat for a few years while, yeah. while that was going on. But it's so interesting that it's always been kind of along the lines as, as a passion that has and you've gone back to it as your kids have grown and okay. now you have the opportunity to do what you're doing now. So when did you first, the idea of making church, church vestments, you said it did cross your path early on. So how did that happen? So it did cross my path very early on in, in my college days, we attended a, a camp, a, college, a church that was on campus, a campus ministry church and there wasn't much money at the church and the pastor asked, he knew, he knew I was sewing and he asked, do you think you could make a stole for me? And I, I thought, well, I don't know anything about making a stole, but what the heck, I'll give it a try and dove in and uh, realized I didn't know what I didn't know. I did my best to put it together and it turned out okay. Um, I didn't know any better, and he proudly wore that stole uh, for many, many years. And um, and then he asked me to make a couple of other things. I, I made a chasuble for him, and then I think we may have done some banners and things like that. But I did that in my in my college days before I graduated. And then the seeds were planted at that time, but you know I didn't think anything more of it. Like yeah. When I you had that experience. It's like you, you, that was like then ingrained in you. And what's interesting is that you said, I, and maybe it's your, how, how the quality of your work now um, is, is obviously very important. And looking back that that didn't have it because, well, first of all, that was your first run of it. Right. But yet he asked you to do more for him. So right. clearly he thought it was excellent <laughs> enough to do more. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, and it was, it was a very different age back then. So we're talking the mid 80s. So, so in the mid 80s, the, the internet didn't exist at all. And there were, you had your local library, but the libraries weren't connected as a library system like they are now. You didn't have access to, or even the knowledge that there were secondhand bookstores out there. So the only thing you had to guide you on doing this process was something existing that the pastor already had. So you could take a pattern off that existing garment. And then maybe there were a couple of catalogs of, of investment companies in the sacristy, but that's all you had for resources in trying to make something. There were no sewing patterns. There was there were no places to get any appliques. Machine embroidery didn't exist at this time. So you were really out there on your own with trying to come up with something. Um, yeah, and embroidery. I mean, I guess the machine embroidery really saved a lot of time. Is that right. one of the benefits? Right. But but again, back in the mid 80s, that didn't exist. Yeah. So very time consuming work. Right, right. So, so you know, you, you were limited to what you had and how creative you could be to put something together back then. So, so like I say, the seeds were planted way back then. And I, I knew when I did it, it was like, well, it turned out, but it's probably not quite right, but I don't know what's wrong with it. And, and it was left there. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting because I don't know if I told you when we were in person or not, but I have a couple of students who have embroidery machines yes. and you know, I didn't know anything about this until I started working with them and they, they just do it. It's their hobbies. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think they even have the capability to make patterns of their own, which right. is so, so great. There's such a, I, I mean, I didn't even think about what a business there is in that with somebody who doesn't even know where to begin and they can look at pa patterns and, and then get an idea. Right, right. So, I mean, it's, it's a very different world today because there are, um, well, I had my first embroidery machine back in um, the early 90s. And you just had a little card that you would plug into the machine. 
you would select the design that was on the card and that was the only option that you had and then you would stitch it out so they produce beautiful designs but but you were limited to the designs that were available today the embroidery machines can stitch beautiful elaborate patterns and oftentimes you can purchase a what's called a digitizing program with the embroidery designs so if you can find artwork, you can create the digital design yourself and then stitch it out with your own machine. Or there's a lot of sites that have a design that's already made. You just purchase it, you download it, and then you stitch it out. So, so the technology today um, opens this up so that really anybody can, can do this. Um, yeah. yeah, and so when did you really go all in on... I really want to make this business something. I really want to scale this. I want to help as many people as I can. What kind of drove you from kind of homeschool mom dabbling in your passion to choosing this, which is a very interesting, we call it niche that, you know, people think sewing uh, or people think fashion design and they immediately think, oh, these outfits that people wear on the runway, or at least I do. Uh, and I don't think about all these little uh, amazing specialty areas. Sure. So, so back in 2007, we had 2006, 2007, our family had moved to a new community. We're in the Brainerd Baxter area in Northern Minnesota. And at that time, the church that we were attending was building, it had just, was in the process of building a new sanctuary. And it was, it was Christmas Eve, 2007, or just a few days before. And I got the idea, wouldn't it be fun if I surprised pastor on Christmas Eve with some new Christmas paraments for the Christmas Eve service. And I hadn't talked to him beforehand, but one should always talk to their pastor before they dive into a project. Uh, I went ahead, I put it together. And on Christmas Eve, I walked in with my husband to pastor's office and we presented it to him as a gift. And he was, he was floored and amazed by what I had created. We quickly went to the altar, we changed everything out, and that was the first set that I had made in, oh gosh, 25, 30 years from my college days when I had- Oh, wow. Had That's so emotional. I mean, I'm like tearing <laughs> up and getting chills. I mean, that is like so, because I think so much of us, we, we, we want to help people, but we always start with- kind of the mindset of how can, how can I make money or how can I get this um, for me? And, and what you just <laughs> was a perfect example is it started as a gift. It, it, and it was, how can I, it was, it was with complete service in mind. Yeah. Yeah. And at that point in 2007, it wasn't any, there wasn't any thought of turning it into a business. It was just we had a new church. There was a need at our church. And, and so I was trying and I to love do doing this. And I love doing this. Absolutely. And so as, as um, other seasons of the church year went along, I, I did consult with my pastor and we talked about other sets to make. And we, I started trying to, I, I realized the set that I had made at Christmas time turned out okay but I still didn't know what I didn't know. And so I thought, okay, my degrees in design, surely I can do some research and I can try to figure this out. And that, that kind of opened a Pandora's box because I, I started diving in and, and trying to figure it out. And I realized there's nothing here to figure this out. How do I do this? So I continued to make sets for our church and tried using different things that I found at the local fabric store. When I worked with them at home, they looked beautiful. When I took them to church and hung them up, everybody else said that how beautiful they looked and how amazing they were. But my critical technical eye as a seamstress realized that the techniques I'd used at home didn't translate well to the pieces actually hanging and looking right. And so I, I started down further down the rabbit hole of trying to figure out how do you, how do you learn? Um, I discovered um, Abe books and Amazon and Amazon UK and Am Abe M um, UK and started researching and found vintage books and started growing a library and, and 
today I have a massive library of, of vintage books, vintage treasures on this. And in, in getting these vintage books, they will give you bits and pieces of how to how they did these things, but they were always written in a level of assumed knowledge. Back in the day, there would have been altar guilds in the church, and they would have handed things down, the older members to the younger members. And, and so what they wrote in the books would have sufficed because there would have always been somebody to go to to help you along the way if you got stuck. Well, so much of that ended up dying off and, and it wasn't passed on and it wasn't shared. And so I had to do a lot of reading between the lines, a lot of experimenting and, and try to recover what was a lost art. Um, yeah, and I, I just have to interject because uh, my, my husband will appreciate this when I use the sports analogy, because this is such a great example of practice uh, makes the the player that goes to the Super Bowl, right? And it's right. not just like the game practice. It's the like studying the tapes, like doing the research. It's like really knowing the game that you're playing to be the best at it. Right. And, right. and, and I so much stress people because, because I think a lot of moms who uh, end up, you know, becoming empty nesters, as I call them, uh, they, they, they're, they're givers, they're nurturers, they're servers. And so we want to always serve, 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 but make sure it's what you love. It's not selfish to do what you love. And so you're, you're serving while doing what you love and you're letting your curiosity drive you uh, to, to make the things that you love the best that they can be. Right, right. And, 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 you know, that's exactly what happened it, it is, is, trying to, to read between the lines and figure this out. And, and so that what I was making, when you're involved in the church, there's always a sense of higher purpose and a, and a, and a, and a means of, of lifting people up. And um, there's, there's that sense of wonder and awe that, that comes with it. And so it doesn't have to be fancy, but it, it should be whatever you do should be the best workmanship and quality that you can do. And with the understanding that we have to give ourselves grace, we all start at one point in time. If I had my early pieces to look at, um, they served and they were given with love and they were the best that I could do at that point in time. And yet I've continued to grow in my skills over the years and, and try to improve my workmanship. So, so it doesn't matter where you start from. But but give it your very best. Yeah. And, yeah. And it's also a great example of what you see out of your eyes is is never I mean, the people that look at it from not the workmanship, you see, so you have that skill built in and that knowledge built in now that you're going to ha come with this more critical eye, whereas the people that are seeing it. They, it's like, it's like the whole thing about the inner critic. We're our own worst inner right. critic. Right. And we like, I can't do that. I don't know enough. I don't. And then the, our friends are all saying, Oh my God, you're killing it. You're just, you're, you're a rock star and it's the best. And so, yeah. And so what you're doing is always going to be better than what you perceive it as. Right. Right. And, 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 and so you know, it's it's to be happy with where you're at at the moment. But if you have that desire, desire and drive to push it to the next level, you know, then go for it. I, one of the things that I always tell my students and and my young employees in training is, don't pick apart the whole thing. Look at what you've done and appreciate the beauty that you've created, and then maybe pick one thing that you think you know, maybe if I focus on this one thing, next time I can do it better. And then focus on that for the next couple of times that you make the item, and then you get that part of it mastered. And then once that's done, then you pick another thing. And so that's kind of the way that I trained myself in, in mastering my skill at this particular art that I had nobody to teach me and nobody to, you know, help guide me on this journey. And, and so that's, the the route that I followed for myself to to grow in my skills and my workmanship and now my kids tease me because 
they say, mom, you see things that nobody else will ever see. And your eye doesn't miss a thing. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah. We all have to go through the, the crappy work to get to the good work. I mean, we, we, there's no, there's no detouring that. It's, right. Yeah. Right. It's just, it's not, not doable. We can hire somebody to do it, but if we want to do it ourselves, we got to like get the, get the skill, skill set built. Right. Um, yeah. So did you ever, as you're, you know, approaching midlife as you're doing this, because, you know, as I do the math, you know, you're probably just getting into it and doing, still doing the things for your church that you've joined, but sure. you're getting close to 50. Uh, but then you're like having ideas of, I'm going to start this business and I'm going to make it grow. And I'm going to be the expert at this. Did you ever have any thoughts about, am I too old for this? Or what am I doing? Am I crazy? Or any of those thoughts that I think a lot of us have when we get to that age? You know, I, I never worried about the age thing and, and that being a problem to hold me back. Uh, and I, and I don't know what point it changed. I, 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 I'm just thinking here now, I don't know at what point it changed from just doing this to my church to doing this as, as a business. Uh, the only thing I can say is that the further I went down the road, the more the door kept opening and I wasn't the one opening the door and willingly walking through, but the door kept opening and opportunities kept presenting to say, come a little further in the journey come a little further in the journey. And, and so I, I just went along with it. Um, and, and I think for this particular role and what I'm doing, I think, I think age is, is, I couldn't have done this as a younger person. I didn't have, I didn't have a lifetime of experience to, to set me up for what I'm doing right now. I think this is, come about because every step along the way of my journey has been a step that has led me to this point. And, and so I, I don't see age as, as being a problem. I, I jokingly tell the kids, I'll be 90 years old and I'll still be in there every day overseeing what's going on. I, I just don't see this as being something I'll ever completely walk away from until I'm unable to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And what I love, and we don't think about this when we're <clears throat> have it an idea or when we have a curiosity that we want to pursue but not only are we an influence as to what's possible for our children uh it, you know because it if your kids are like mine and they're just like trying to figure it out right and there's like 30s and 40s still uh and and wanting to do what you know, what make enough money to help with their family, but yet, you know, is this really what I'm supposed to do? Is it, is this, am I following my heart? Uh, I think they have a lot more knowledge of how important that is than because our mom does what she does. Uh, but also nowadays there's a lot of access to like, you know, and, and information that you should be doing what you, you you love to do. Um, but yet we don't think about the legacy that we're leaving, like what we could build that we could give to our children, you know, what we could hand down to our children. Uh, and so people might think not your average grandma, but you know, that's me right now, but my kids will be grandmas one day and potentially they could step into this carry on the, not your average grandma, uh, you know, message. And, right. um, and yeah, and you have, you're building a team. So you're not like sewing. You're not necessarily the one that's doing the sewing anymore. I don't think, because I remember you telling me you have seamstresses that work for you now. Right. And oh my gosh, like step into the business. You know, it's not the family like mechanic business It's anymore. It's not the, you have to do the things like to serve people in person. You can serve people virtually uh, and you can, there's, there's so many ways in which you can build a business that you can hand down that your, your children will, will know and love and can carry on your legacy by doing. Right. And, and we talk about that. We talk about that, that this is, this is a, a legacy business, what, what we're building. Um, it's, it's something that, you know, whether the kids carry on the day-to-day -day part of the sewing or not down the road, but, but all of my family is involved in the business in some aspect and I, and I'm blessed to have them as, as part of it. And, and what I'm giving them, it, whether they continue with this business or, or find their own niche, is it's an opportunity to, to learn about the business world and to explore their own 
possibilities to to see what their potential is and and just to start it at a much younger age than I ever was able to do it, but also to um, provide wisdom and and guidance should they they ask for it and and oftentimes they do and yet to let them be free and to explore and be free to make mistakes and support them and love them along the journey so so it is it is a legacy business and even to the point where I have my two little granddaughters working with me every day and um how old are they um, one just turned four and she's very proud of that. And, and the other one is five and she'll be turning six in July. So, so they're very young. That's, um, that's amazing though. Right. But they, but they see, they see the whole family working together and, um, and they're just a part of it. Mm-hmm. So, so it's a lot of fun. That's great. So what would you say to somebody who is, has this passion and they're not sharing it? with the world or others, or they're not taking that next step out of fear. You talked about, and when you submitted what you were going to talk about and what, you know, uh, I had some questions that I always ask my guests in advance. And she said, one of the things is that was a fear of hers when she started was actually cutting into the fabric because the fabric, if you can imagine, you saw like a hundred dollars a yard or 200, I don't know, something crazy. It, 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 uh, the, the brocades and the fabrics that we use come from a company in the UK and the company's been in business since the 1870s. They, they've been weaving many of the same fabrics for well over probably 150 years. Uh, the fabrics are beautiful and they're recognized throughout the, the church world. And, and yes, they are expensive. They're, they're a hundred to 200, $250 a yard, something like that. And so, most of us, when we sew, an expensive fabric might be twenty-five or thirty dollars a yard, maybe forty. Most of us have never touched anything in the range of over a hundred dollars a yard, and and so that does have a, a certain amount of paralyzing fear that comes with it. Yeah, so, I can see how that would stop a seamstress. <laughs> it's like that would be an expensive mistake, but yet, uh, so these are some of the fears that we don't even realize we have that crop right. up, right? Yeah. Right. They are. And, and I have to admit, the first time I was diving into these, I really had to take stock. But I didn't dive into the $100 a yard fabrics on my very first project. I had, I had built my way up to that point and had practiced with, with fabrics that were at a lower price point to gain my confidence and to gain my skill. And, and with each time that I felt I had gained skill and, and confidence, I would step up the game to a, a another level and caliber of, of fabric. And so I, I did my, work my way up there. You know, if somebody does want to start out with the expensive fabrics right away, one of the things I talk about on my blog is, is to take the time and, and lay that fabric out maybe on a bed or on a table or something in a, in a spare room if you've got a sewing table out on a sewing table and take the time to look at it and study the pattern and get to know it. And every time that you walk by, notice something about it, notice the pattern repeats and how the, how the pattern repeat works on the fabric. And taking that time to get to know it a little bit before you dive in and cut will help assure you, um, you know, how, how might I use this? Where, where might this particular motif look good as I'm cutting and placing my pattern? Ah, so that's so interesting. Those kind of things do help and, and, and then it helps build your confidence. So, so if you, you know, kind of like a roadmap, if you're taking a trip and a journey, when we used to use paper maps, you know, look at where you're going before you actually go there and, yeah. and kind of plan it out. Yeah. Um, Cause you want the bathroom to be, you know, within a couple of hours of you leaving. <laughs> That needs to be in the middle of the, right. the journey, middle of the right. fabric. <laughs> right. right. And yeah. so those things can help. And, um, you know, we, we do have a blog post that does have information on, on doing some cutting and things like that. So uh, when people reach out to me, I do try to recommend that they, they search our blog post for articles and stuff. But uh, the bottom line, if you have a passion and, and, you know, fear is holding you back, try to identify what that fear is. 
is it is it the fear of cutting this and that I might make a mistake? Well, we will make mistakes as we as we do things in life, and that's part of our growth. If 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 I had been afraid to ruin a hundred dollar a yard fabric, I would never have gotten off the ground. And I will tell you to this day, there are times when I still can ruin a piece of a hundred dollar a yard fabric and cut it wrong, and then I'm going, oh shoot, I should know better but I still make the mistake. So, you know, all I can say is we have to give ourselves grace to learn and to try, but, but don't be afraid. Don't let it hold you back because we all have the potential of, of doing things, especially those of us who like to work with our hands. We have a special gift and to use our hands to create things of beauty that others don't know how to create. It, it really it really can help somebody else in their life journey. Yeah. Yeah. And to follow up with something you said earlier is, you know, look at what doors have been opening that you might not have been walking through. They've been opening and you've either been saying, Oh, I don't think so for whatever reason. And maybe fear is one of them. Uh, but they're opening for a reason. And right. so that is something that you might want to think about. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, my last question for you is to tell me and the listeners what example what how do you exemplify living a sparked second half and what are you most sparked about in the near term? Sure. So, you know, at, at my age in life, I, I feel I'm stepping into a role and to a business and a world that I never, never would have dreamed of in my college days. You know, when I decided not to go to New York and pursue that dream, and when I walked away from my bridal business to raise a family and to help my husband grow his business over the years, I never imagined that I would have the opportunity to ever open my own business. And yet, here I am in my early 60s. I have a business that has been around. Um, we've been working at it, I think, six or seven years already. And we have a worldwide reach. And we've impacted the hundreds of lives, if not thousands of lives, all over the world with, with what we do. And that's very, that's very humbling and 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 it's it's not of my own doing that we do this. I know there's a higher power and a higher calling that's opening those doors and those opportunities. And I'm I'm very grateful to be of service in the work that we do. Um, and and so um, I try to listen to that calling and and the plans that are there and that are laid for me and the service that I can do and. One of the things that that is a new calling that that we hope to get up and get going in the near time is to become more involved in offering classes for others who would like to learn about this journey and to explore it on their own. And, and perhaps they just need a little bit of a helping hand to give them that courage to cut into that hundred dollar yard fabric. And so, um, my hope and prayer is that in, in the coming months and maybe the, over the next year or so, we'll be able to offer online courses to help others to um, step into this journey, whether it's a one-time thing or whether it's somebody who would like to do this for people within their parish or to turn it into their own little micro business that they can work in out of their homes. There's, there's so many different ways that people yeah. can serve and use their love of sewing and doing that. So yeah, so, so many different paths. So many different and one paths. path can lead to another. It can. It can. And um, you just have to you have to take a moment and be still. And I, I think that's what sewing allows you to do. It allows you to quiet your mind and quiet your soul and to have that opportunity. It's much like meditation. It, some people use it as prayer and contemplative time. But it, it allows you to quiet and still and shut out that busy world around you. And, and then at that point in time, you actually can see doors opening when we're quiet. Yeah. And know what's there for you, for your, for your 
sparked, you know, second half of our lives. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's yeah. great. And I asked the second part of the question because having just been to two of our coaches retreats, which are pretty powerful mm -hmm. when you leave, you're kind of like, whoa, <laughs> stepping in kind of a new version of yourself. Uh, and you, you heard me share something. I had a huge breakthrough. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to actually talk about it in my next podcast, uh, episode, but yeah, what, what for you kind of sparked you like going forward in the next, next near term? So I, I think it's, I think it's a couple of things. I, I, I love creating beauty and, and I've always been a creative person. And so I, I can't see myself ever walking away from that. I, I, the more I do this and each time we do things, we're always pushing the level of, of what we can create. And so having that drive of, of pushing and creating the next piece of beauty, that's almost like a piece of art. I'm, I'm hungry for that. And I love to keep exploring that. Um, being here as a mom and providing opportunities for my kids is also very much a driving force, um, but then also serving others and, and the testimonials and the feedback that we get from our clients and how this has impacted them and the worship life of their church and the gifts that they've been able to create and provide those messages are so heartfelt and, and so full of, of beautiful emotions. And so I've been blessed in my life. And if I can give back and serve others so that they in turn can serve and create that beautiful ripple effect in our world, it's, it's, it's the door I've been called to go yeah. through. Yeah. Think of all the multiple uh, churches uh, and worship places. Cause I know the traditional cert, uh, church is not necessarily where people go anymore. Some go to schools that are <laughs> churches on Sunday and yeah, but I mean, just to, to, you said we've impacted hundreds, if not thousands, clearly thousands, because just one church vestment can impact a thousand people that attend the church. <laughs> so, yeah, it's easily that. It's probably in the millions. <laughs> You're just being humble. But anyways, yes, thank you so much for being here. I, as I said in the beginning, you have such an interesting niche and or niche or whatever, however you pronounce that. But uh, yeah, you're just such a great example of somebody who who does what she loves and and wants to to make an impact in the world. Lori, thank you so much. It's it's just been such a pleasure. I I feel so honored to have had a chance to have met you at these past two events, and and thank you so much for um, asking me to be on your podcast with you. I it's just very much an honor to be here and to speak with you today. Yes. Thanks. So much. I, you know, I did not tell you this, but I just have to end with this because you, I, I, do you ever see doppelgangers, you know, where people look like other people? Yes. <laughs> you look like my aunt. Oh, really? Yeah. When she was younger. I mean, she's, she's aged very well, but like my dad's sister, you look, you could, you could be her, her sister easily more so than her real sister's look they don't look as much like her uh but yeah you look so much like her i'll have to find a picture of her and share it with oh, you yeah <laughs> uh, she's she's like my favorite aunt i love her so much yes yeah. uh -huh. i hope my other aunts don't listen to this podcast <laughs> uh, i love them all <laughs> all right bye 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 thanks Lori. okay bye Thank you so much for tuning into the Living Your Spark Second Half podcast. If you'd like to watch my guest interviews, you can find the video version of this podcast on my Not Your Average Grandma YouTube channel. Also, you can check out what I have going on at the moment by going to my website at notyouraveragegrandma.com or find me on Instagram or Facebook at Not Your Average Grandma. If you like this episode, please mention it to a friend and don't forget to leave a review so I know the topics you like best and can bring you more of that content in upcoming episodes. Last but not least, remember to always listen to that inner voice that will never steer you wrong and make living from the most sparked place possible your biggest priority. When we do that, we make the world a better place.